Hello and welcome to the Homesteading Academy where homesteaders come to learn. This is Lisa and I am with Yogi Hollow Farm. And today we have a very exciting guest speaker with us and that is Nick from Arizona Highland Homestead who will speak with us about composting 101 and the benefits of composting. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Nick from Arizona Highland Homesteading. Hello, Nick. Hey, Lisa. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here with us today. Absolutely. I love to share all of the knowledge I have and I'm still learning as I told you earlier, but um, composting is one of my passions. I think everybody should be composting and uh, it's pretty easy. So can't wait to talk about it. Well, we're looking forward to it. Do tell us. I mean, I want you to tell me you just said that like it really made a big change for you. I'd like to know why, why you have that passion and then feel free to let us know all about it. Yeah. So uh, I guess to bring it way back, uh, we used to live in San Diego, California, and there we didn't have uh, any land really. In fact, at one point we were living in a two bedroom, two bath condo downstairs below somebody else. We didn't have any garden, uh, but one of the things that we tried to do is try to be good stewards of what we've uh, been entrusted with to manage while we're on this earth. And um, one of those things is our waste. So a lot of people have um, trash services, right? That come, they come to your house, they take it away and you never see it again. And uh, when I was in school, they were talking about, you know, re, uh, reuse, re reduce, recycle, right? And uh, I always thought, well, that makes sense. Yeah, sure. If uh, we throw it in a landfill, we can't ever, you know, use it again or recycle it. Um, and uh, so we, you know, we should definitely reduce what we, what we um, get rid of. Um, because once we throw it in a landfill, it's not going to be used, useful at all anymore. Um, so... Uh, a while back when, um, my wife and I got married, we, uh, we were throwing away our old food scraps, right? And that was just kind of the process. And I think that's what a lot of people do. It's, it's kind of the natural thing to do. If you aren't going to use it yourself again, might as well throw it in, uh, and have, uh, people take it away where you never see it again. Right. Uh, well, at one point we realized, um, you know, this is stuff that we, paid good money for. Uh, it might be, you know, the, uh, um, the top of a carrot or it might be, uh, whatever top of a pineapple, or I, I don't know, whatever it might be. Um, uh, coffee grounds, right. We, we paid for that and now we're throwing it away. Is there anything that we could be using that for? Um, and we weren't very, um, we weren't very thrifty and we weren't very, uh, conscious, conscious about, um, repurposing stuff or reusing stuff. But, um, we did realize that there is this thing called composting. And, uh, we actually, um, rented a house, uh, one year and, uh, we, we put in a garden bed. The landlord said we could put in a garden bed in the backyard, uh, where somebody had a garden bed at one time and we bought a whole bunch of compost and we put it in there. And then we thought, well, we should be making this we have food scraps and you know, maybe it'll take a decade to make compost. We've never made it before. So we thought, well, let's start. So, um, so what is compost? There might be some people that wonder what, do you, what are you even talking about? What is compost? Mm -hmm. um, I've heard about that, but I don't really know what it is. Well, it's organic matter that's decomposed and contains lots of nutrients, vitamins, minerals uh, for plants to grow. Um, what we think of it as, as, um, organic mulchy soil fertilizer. That's kind of what my wife, Daniel, and I think about it, um, how, how we think about it. It can be used as mulch where you can put it over top of something. And, um, but it's, it's organic, which, uh, there's a confusion because of the label organic on foods, uh, mm -hmm. of, of what I mean by organic matter. So organic matter is anything that was living at one time. So, Pretty, pretty simple, but, um, but it, it, to, to further confuse things, uh, compost is 
uh, organic matter that has decomposed again, but mm -hmm. it's also an organic fertilizer. So what does that term mean? And what does that term mean on food, uh, food labels and things? Uh, that means that it doesn't use any pesticides or herbicides, basically, mm -hmm. uh, to grow those those foods. So um, this is this is not a um, and, and it's not an inorganic fertilizer, which means it's is basically a fertilizer made from salt. So mm -hmm. um, there's chemical fertilizers and then there's organic fertilizers. So you can kind of keep those in your mind. Um, but that's what compost is. It's it's an organic fertilizer really is what it comes down to. And that's why most people use it, but it does have the appearance of soil. Maybe it might be darker colored soil. It uh, might have different characteristics than the soil in your yard or in your, on your property or what you're familiar with. But, um, but that is uh, what compost is. Again, it's organic matter. So something that was living at one time that is decomposed and contains lots of nutrients, vitamins, and minerals for plants to grow. Um, does that make sense? Do you have any questions about that, Lisa? No, it makes perfect sense. Okay. So, uh, so then a lot of people wonder, well, what do I need to start composting? Uh, I, I, I like this idea, right? Things decomposing, that sounds pretty yeah. gross and, and stinky. <laughs> well, what, what do I need? Am I going to need a mask? Is, you know, <laughs> what, what do I need? And, um, and those are probably pretty good questions, right? Is it safe? Is it, is this going to uh, cause me some some uh, health concerns if I if I have a problem with um, you know the decomposition and everything? Um, yeah. But but uh, it's it's really it's organic, so it's it's good. It, it's it's okay. And and those are those are uh, kind of concerns that we had in the beginning. Is this going to smell like? manure is it gonna what, what, what's it gonna be like um but but here's some of the things i wrote down of what you need uh, number one is that you need correct ratios or amounts of three ingredients uh number one is browns number two is greens and number three is water so everybody knows what water is i, I assume but uh, yeah. browns and greens you, you might think are we talking crayola crayons what what's going on here nick uh, browns and greens um well um browns and greens so browns can be uh leaves uh so it, they tend to be brown which is why they call them browns but not always and greens tend to be green but not always they uh, like coffee grounds are greens but they're brown so there can be some confusion here, so I'll, I'll try to iron everything out and make it, it clear as day, but uh, just hang with me here. I'm with you. All right. So uh, browns can be like fall leaves, deciduous leaves that fall down. Those are brown, so that, mm -hmm. that makes sense. But it can also be things like shredded paper, cardboard, wood chips, um, shavings, uh, wood shavings, uh, sawdust. It could even be dried grass. So maybe not green grass, but dried grass uh, can be browns. So the, the way I think about it is um, a lot of stuff that's kind of kind of woody sort of, if you can think of it that way. It's, it doesn't have a whole lot of green stuff in it. If, uh, if it got trapped underneath something, it wouldn't be a big pile of goo. It'd be a big pile of, of kind of dried, crushed, you know, organic matter um, is what, what that is. Lots of so carbon. Like, Sorry. So like, a, like a, a pine needle. So, you know, a, a dead pine needle would be brown. Correct. A living Correct. or a green pine needle would be a green. That's right. Yeah. Okay. You got it, Lisa. Yeah. It's uh, it's those kind of things. So um, if, if you think of it kind of that way, um, what what uh, what to remember about, uh, and, and I could kind of get into the details a little bit too much. You don't need to know this stuff all that much, but uh, but it's called carbon and nitrogen. And if you've taken any kind of chemistry, you know that carbon and nitrogen are in all kinds of molecules out there, but especially living things uh, have a lot of carbon and nitrogen. Green and living things have a lot of nitrogen in them. Nitrogen moves quickly through living things. So it's not there for long. And once they die, it's gone real fast. So that's why I'm saying, you know, fall leaves that have fallen off the tree, like you mentioned, pine needles that are dead, 
um, those types of things, the nitrogen's mostly gone out of those things. Mm -hmm. So high in carbon, lower in nitrogen is what browns are. And then greens, I kind of already explained some of what those are by comparing them to browns, but um, they tend to have that nitrogen still in them. Grass clippings that, um, you know, if you're mowing a lawn, those, those would be considered greens. Also, uh, some old veggies. I mentioned the top of a carrot or, um, or uh, you know, a stalk of broccoli or something like that. Those would be greens because you haven't left them to dry out and become brown uh, and, and dead like a pine needle. Um, but And I also mentioned coffee. Coffee grounds are greens. Um, tea, um, <clears throat> like tea bags, uh, green grass, green leaves, old fruit, uh, and then also some manures. Um, we use a lot of chicken manure and our quail manure here, and those are very high in nitrogen, uh, very green. Um, they can actually burn plants. They're so green. So if you put them on, it's, it's, uh, if you put them right on the plants, they can, they can burn them. So, uh, and then there are some other manures as well. I won't get into all the different manures because that's kind of a whole different topic in, in itself, but we, we can talk about that if we have time uh, later on and, and maybe even some experience you've had uh, with that, Lisa. Um, but, I do have a question. Yes. So if chicken manure is considered green because it's full of nitrogen, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yeah. Would rabbit manure be considered green or brown? I would consider it a green. Okay, yeah. so it's based on the nitrogen, not necessarily the fact that it's a hot or a cold manure. I would I would consider it to be a green, um, but uh, we're we're really getting into kind of the um, the fine details of composting, and it doesn't need to be hard. Uh, it's it's actually way easier. I'm I'm just kind of giving you what you need is kind of where I I was starting to go with this. So you need ratios of three things again: um, water uh, browns and greens. Uh, it's, okay. it's real simple, but it's correct ratios and amounts of those things. And it's not like you have to weigh it out and, and do that. I'll get to kind of the details of how easy it really is here in a moment, but you need browns, you need greens, you need water. So, um, that's, that's the beginning of it. And then you need a location for, uh, your pile. Uh, so a lot of people just compost in a big heap a big pile on the ground. And that works. That, that works just fine. Um, the, uh, the location though is, is an important thing. You want it to be convenient um, where you can get to it, but you also want it to be out of the way. You could um, potentially get into things where um, some types of animals might get into your compost and may spread it around. And, and that's not what you want. You want to keep it in a pile. So I'll get into how to avoid those things here in a minute, but um, but you need to have a location that you may not you may not um, mind it being over there. And in the beginning, when you're just starting to figure it out, it could potentially get stinky. It could get really dried out. All of it could blow away in the wind. There's all kinds of different things that you might want to think about. So a location for the pile is important. Um, and the size of that location is important. Uh, you don't want a real small pile. Uh, the bigger the pile, there, it's kind of a, in, in my mind, this is how we do it. Um, we like to have a balance of a, a large enough pile, but not too large of a pile. We don't have a tractor and, and, and big equipment to move it around. So we use a pitchfork and, or a shovel, and, um, and that works pretty good for us. But other people, they it may just they might be a, a single person, and they may not have a very big pile in the beginning. So um, the bigger the pile, the faster and better uh, it will go. It will turn over. It will decompose faster, um, and the more consistent its center will be. And uh, we'll we'll get into that about the the center of it and how it holds heat. And there's all kinds of um, decomposition going on in there and that's that's why you get the heat but a smaller pile is easier to find a spot for and it's easier to move it's easier to turn and it's easier just in general to manage um and having multiple locations 
is uh, are are highly recommended, but it's not necessarily a must. You could just have one location for uh, a pile, and a pile doesn't need to be on the ground. Um, it could be um, it could be in a really small container. I've seen people do lots of composting at, just in a five gallon bucket. So um, I would say a five gallon bucket is probably the minimum size that I would go with. Um, but you, I've seen piles that are gigantic. I mean, really long in an industrial composting scenario. In fact, um, through COVID, they didn't have enough processors to process pigs. I don't know if you heard about this, Lisa, but I did. Yeah, they dumped all these pigs. It was such a waste, but they dumped them into this compost, and in two weeks they were gone. They're completely gone. It was, it was pretty amazing. So, uh, but that's a really large compost pile. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, to to uh, recap on what you need, you need correct ratios of uh, browns and greens and water. Uh, you need a location for the pile, and multiple locations are very very highly recommended, but not a must. Even just two locations for piles would be great right next to each other would, would be uh, ideal. And you do need some kind of small, or I'd highly recommend a very small container in the kitchen so that you're not taking every, you know, banana peel out to the compost pile. You're, you're gathering it up. And we have, I think it's a one to two gallon little bucket with a lid in the kitchen that's just on the kitchen counter and it, it looks nice it's it and uh and we don't mind it we have guests over we may put it underneath the sink for a moment but um it it doesn't stink uh unless we leave it there for a long time and it starts growing mold and stuff and then you know it, you've waited too long to take it out go take it out to that pile it's decomposing it's doing what you want it to do but probably want to do it out there and uh, a lot of the times we have greens in our kitchen. We don't tend to cook with fallen leaves and cardboard and uh, these brown kind of materials, you know, wood chips and things. We cook with green stuff, you know, fresh stuff. So right, tend to have greens. And uh, I guess I could get into that a little bit now too. If, if your ratios are off, um, you'll know. Because when you have too much greens, it gets kind of soupy and gooey and gross because there's a lot of nitrogen in there. It's kind of like it's turning into a soup. You don't want a soup. You want it to be, um, you want there to be browns in there. And that's kind of, when I was first starting out, that was one of the things is that I just kept putting greens in there. Well, greens and greens over and over again, because that's mostly what we had. We didn't have a bunch of deciduous trees and we didn't think about, our um our bills that we would shred through the shredder and use those shreds and put those in there as browns um so it became kind of a gooey soup and it will stink if you have the ratios incorrect there and you got too much nitrogen on the flip side if you have too many browns it'll likely um get dry or just look like a bunch of mulch in there a bunch of wood chips and and leaves and um, and, and things like that, like a forest floor, it, it won't, it won't be decomposing. It'll just be kind of static the way it was because you don't have enough nitrogen in there to, to break down all, all of those browns. Um, and then with the water too, you can make a soup or it can be so dry that it just will blow away. Uh, here in Arizona, that's what we suffer from is from it being too dry. So, um, so let's see. One one of the other things with with the water is that you can um, you can use a tarp or you can even put a cover over top of your your um, your composting area. You know, like a carport or something like that. You could you could have all different types of covers, but you don't want it to get too wet and you don't want it to get too dry. You uh, you basically want it to to be. Uh, kind of like a, a soil would be for your plants when, when you have, when you're watering your plants, you don't want it to be where you squeeze it and water's just dripping out and you don't want it to just, when you squeeze it, it just kind of crumbles. You want it to kind of stick together a little bit and you, you can stick your hand in there and see what it's like, but you'll kind of get the feeling of it and you'll know again, if it's too, too much nitrogen, it becomes soupy and stinky if it if it's 
uh, I got too many browns. It's just dry or not not doing anything. It just looks like wood chips or mulch. Um, and then too much water is is pretty obvious too. Okay. Um, there's one other thing that you need, but it's usually kind of just a given. And uh, but it it might not be, especially if you live in a, a really wet area, uh, especially if it's wet and cold. Um, and that's air. It, it, it needs oxygen, actually, because uh, there's lots of microbes and, and decomposers in there, uh, small, small little organisms that are breaking it down. And some of them might be bigger. You might see um, you might see all kinds of different bugs and things in there. And and that's good. A lot of people think, oh, no, I, I don't want bugs in there. No. You know what? It's a big ecosystem is what it ends up becoming. Mm -hmm. And those decomposers are doing work for you. They're they're breaking it down, turning it from from trash into treasure literally it it, it right. really has changed our lives a whole bunch because instead of throwing our stuff out uh stuff that we paid for at the grocery store and food's not cheap that's right yeah it it became fertilizer for us to grow more food with which is just it's almost a miracle uh is the way i think about it i'm i'm so um passionate about compost i think it's one of the easiest things that we can do, uh, it reduces a lot of waste and it reduces um, having to go somewhere to buy fertilizer and and um, and we even treat it kind of like soil and mulch, like like I was saying, it's, it's kind of a mulchy fertilizer. Um, so a tarp can keep water in or out. That's kind of where, where I left off there. If you live in the climate we live in, we need to uh, water it down with a, a watering can or a, a bucket or uh, even drip irrigation. Uh, you can you can water the compost pile that way, but, but a tarp really keeps that moisture there, keeps it from just evaporating out in this in the southwest here where uh, everything's so dry. But in other areas, it gets so wet that you need to uh, put the tarp on top of the compost pile to keep it from getting too wet. Uh, because it, it won't compost well if that air isn't in that um, compost pile. So um, so carbon, nitrogen, moisture, and air, it's a decomposer party. It's an amazing place for these decomposers to gather together, to reproduce, to turn your trash into treasure, and uh, I... I just love it. And they, they come, they'll come from all over to come into your compost pile and work for you for free. Uh, it's, it's really great. So, um, uh, so does, does all that make sense, Lisa? Do you have any questions about all the stuff that you need? I do. I do. It all makes sense. In fact, yeah. I plan on watching this several times to make sure I have it in my brain because Clearly, I know that we don't have the right ratios in our compost pile. Um, we have a few locations. So I have a few questions for you. Yeah. You mentioned using shredded mail. Yep. Can you talk a little bit more about that for the audience so that folks understand what is acceptable and what is not? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, there, this is this is a big topic, by the way. I know it's a simple question, but uh oh, leave it to me. <laughs> yeah, you open up a can of decomposing worms. Um, no, they. Uh, so I've got this thing right here. This is some, you know, something that we opened up, and uh, this this paper part's good here. Uh, yep. Sometimes this ink on here. Some people can be particular about that and say, oh, no, unless it's soy-based ink, I don't want it in my compost pile. Hey, th that's your decision to make. Um, and, you know, maybe these blue lines in here, you say, oh, no, I don't want that ink. You know, all I want is um, just, the, just the plain paper. Or maybe you think that bleached paper isn't good and that you don't want that. Hey, you know what you want to have in uh, amongst the roots of your plants because – and that that's up to you. What what's not going to work is this this piece of plastic right here. That's not going to decompose. I mean, it may wear away in the sun. It it may it may go away, but that's not gonna that's not gonna work. Not, nothing's gonna eat the plastic. 
So try to keep plastic out of there. Um, there's there's other things. I was I was going to get into it a little bit later too, but um, herbicides and pesticides are problematic. So, uh, you know, if, if you know that there's herbicides in something you put in there, maybe not male, but, but maybe – Here's one that threw me for a loop just recently. So we got these sheep. We were talking about us uh, again, these sheep just a little while ago, Lisa, before we came on and, and uh, we're feeding them hay and we were looking for organic hay or organic hay is really hard to find. So mm -hmm. uh, the reason we were looking for organic hay was because we heard that there's some long-term pests or herbicides that are used uh, to grow some of these, these crops, uh, that they make into hay. Uh, alfalfa is a big one, uh, where they'll spray. I don't know what herbicide it is. I'm not super familiar with herbicides cause we don't use them, but they'll spray herbicides to reduce the weeds that are amongst the alfalfa plants. And then that herbicide is actually in and amongst the alfalfa plant. It's on the alfalfa that you you're buying and feeding to your animals. And then if you're composting their manure or any leftover, you know, hay, uh, then that herbicide is going to be killing your vegetable plants in your garden, perhaps, you know, if it's a long-term herbicide. There's some short-term ones that will break down pretty quick. And you know what? The heat of the compost in that center of that pile, it breaks down a whole lot of stuff. So it may break down some of that herbicide, but you may be putting herbicide in your garden mm -hmm. and not even really realize what's happening. But you're putting compost in the garden thinking you're fertilizing when you're actually killing off all your plants. So that's something that was was a recent discovery for me. And I, I've been composting for decades now. So there's lots to learn, uh, mm -hmm. but really the inputs like you said, are there any things that you want to avoid? Some paper like this, I haven't found any any paper like this. We'll, we'll shred a lot of our, our mail, um, and uh, then it's it's finely shredded. And the finer the pieces are, the faster they break down um, because there's more surface area and the decomposers can, can break down um, those pieces a little bit better. But... Um, there have been some, some weird things that we've seen from time to time, and it's caused me to wonder, maybe we, you know, we've, we've uh, purchased straw bales before to prepare garden beds, and I've wondered now, maybe that straw had some herbicide in it. Uh, and then pesticides, too. You might think, oh, well, pesticides are, are no big deal, right? Because uh, this is for the plants in my garden. I'm not, I don't have animals, and I'm not worried about insects. That's no big deal. Yeah, it is because it's not going to decompose like it should if you're killing off all of those decomposers that are coming in and wanting to decompose your, your compost pile for you. So a um, couple, couple things to keep in mind. But, uh, yeah, as, as far as, um, as paper goods go, uh, cardboard's also uh, in there. We'll, we'll use cardboard quite frequently. We'll avoid the cardboard that's heavily inked, uh, and we'll mm -hmm. avoid packing tape and things like that, glues and, and things. Uh, but cardboard, for the most part, we found is okay for uh, composting. Uh, a lot of people wonder about that. And there are some, you know, cardboard isn't just paper. It's It's got other stuff in it. But it seems like it's been okay for us for the most part. Um, and some people might disagree with me. And maybe over time, I'll say, hey, no, I don't want cardboard anymore. I found out something about it that I don't like. But so far, it's been good. So it sounds like in addition to the science of it, of having the ratios correct, there really is some preference as well yes. as to what you want in there. Yeah, there, there's a lot of things that, um, there, there's kind of two extremes. There's one extreme of compost compost people, I'll say, uh, compost proponents like, like I am, that say compost everything. And they're not joking. They they mean when they say everything, they mean everything that's ever been part of a living being. Uh, plant Me or, too. Absolutely. Really. Yeah. Yep. And uh, and to tell you the truth, I'm I'm farther on that end of the spectrum than on the other end. Uh, the other okay. end is 
I'm only composting stuff that um, well, I, I don't know. That there's a lot of limits on it. Only sure. stuff that's organic, only vegetable matter, um, only only stuff where I know exactly where it came from, came from my property. You know, people will say things like that. And, and I understand that mentality too, hundred percent, you know, where it came from. It's just, just like us. I want to grow my own food because I know where it came from. Right. So right. inputs being, you know, where they came from. Absolutely. Hey, if that's, if that's your thing, do it and do it. Well, I, I, uh, I can understand that completely. So, you, you mentioned meat, Lisa. I wasn't going to get into that, that quite yet, but uh, we compost all of the stuff that uh, we won't eat or that our dogs won't eat that is any kind of meat product. So um, we have quail and we butcher the quail. Uh, a lot of people butcher chickens, feathers, beaks, uh, bones, feet, organs, blood, all of it. All of it can go in the compost. And I'll tell you what, it's gone fast and I've never smelt it because we figured out how to have a big enough compost pile and not mess with it for a certain period of time. And you can, I mean, composting is all about experimentation, figuring out the seasonality of it. That's a huge part of it too. If it's uh, how low, how low does do temperatures get where you live, Lisa? It gets cold. Uh, last year we had with a wind chill negative 30, Ooh. but we were a little below zero. Yeah. See, that's, that's pretty cold, but you can still compost in, in that cold of weather. It's pretty hot in the center. Now it's not going to turn over as fast at that time of year as it will in the summer. But those are the kind of things that you really need to experiment with because it's going to be different for you than it is for me in Arizona. And it's going to be different for somebody in Maine versus Florida. And, and so there's no one size fits all. Hey, turn it every few days and water it every few days and add this many greens and this many browns. No, you're going to have to experiment a little bit. And when you see it soupy, add some browns in there, maybe back off on the water. If you've been adding water, try stuff out and figure it out. It might get stinky at times. It might get really dry, but it's the way that I treat compost is like it's a potted plant. If you think of it kind of like a potted plant, hey, I need to check it every few days, at least once a week, make sure it's got enough water, you know, um, make sure it's not, it's not getting too hot or too cold or, or all these things, right? You want to take care of it. It's, it's a, it's a living, breathing um, ecosystem in there. And uh, so you want to take care of it, but um, but you can definitely put in meat the, there's a few things that people say, don't put in the compost. Um, they'll say, uh, meat oils uh, and breads, uh, typically are, are, have you heard of anything else that people say don't compost? No, I've heard of those, those things, but the big one was meat because what I've been told, yeah. you know, whether right or wrong, it was, it's going to attract, uh, you know, critters. Absolutely. It, it sure will. And especially if you're doing a small amount, like that five gallon bucket uh, scenario I, I talked about, there are people that will, will do small composting setups. And when you're in a condo or an apartment or something like that, yeah, it's, it's going to be harder. It's going to take longer for it to turn over because there's not this, this big mass of compost. Um, so it's going to take longer. And likewise, you're probably not going to want to put a whole, you know, roasted chicken or whatever right in the middle of that five-gallon bucket. It's going to end up being a rotten chicken and not composting because there's nothing else there but a big chicken. So <laughs> you have to think about it in your mind. Is this is this going to make a big stink and is it just going to be a big rotten piece of flesh? Then probably you want to get those ratios right, you know, make more browns all around it and turn it over and stuff. But for us, you know, with, with little um, coil parts, uh, I'll just kind of leave it at that, uh, feathers and things. If we bury it into the middle of the compost pile, it's not there in a week and a half. It's uh, no bones, nothing. 
I can't find anything. In fact, we put uh, we put uh, colored zip ties on their legs for leg bands to identify the different uh, animals, and uh, the legs and other parts went in, or the feet went in there with the bands on and everything. And that's all that was left was that little zip tie because it's it's plastic, and yeah. plastic's not going to decompose. So we pulled that pulled those out of there but um we just wanted to see we wanted to experiment hey is this going to work but no bones at all no feathers we couldn't find any any resemblance wow. of what we put in there so you have to try it for yourself again i wouldn't recommend putting a whole chicken in a small compost pile or a big steak or something like that but you know why would you you, you know yeah you know, eat that stuff don't waste it uh eat it before it's rotten right but uh, but yeah, people also say don't put in bread and there, there's a few reasons. Oils make a lot of sense to me not to put a bunch of oil in there, but again, it's, it's a ratio thing. If you just have a little bit of oil in a huge compost pile, it's going to spread out and it's not going to kill off those bugs that are in there decomposing for you. Right. But, uh, if you do put a lot of oil in there, you know, like you put in all your baking grease and it's. Baking grease everywhere in the pile. Yeah, it's gonna not be a good thing, and you're gonna attract a whole bunch of critters. But uh, if if uh, if you don't have uh, the ratios wrong and out of balance, it probably will work out. Just like those those whatever they were, hundreds of pigs in a compost pile. That's a yeah. lot of that's a lot of oil, a lot of fat, right? A lot of yeah. meat. Um, and they, they decompose just fine, but it's about the ratio and the size of the pile. Um, but I, I hope that makes sense and answers that question for you. Yeah. And I mean, it also makes sense because it's, it's the type of oil, right? Because if you think about putting in, um, lard from a pig is much different than putting an oil that has been modified. That's right. Yeah. So I think there's, there's, you know, the, like you said, it, there's the ratio, but it's also the, the type of oil you're using. Is that, would that be correct? I'd say so, because you could put, uh, inorganic, um, you know, motor oil, for instance, in there, petroleum based stuff. And that was never living at one time. And I, I don't right. think, you know, but those those oils and things, they they will still be in there. They'll they'll probably break down, but um, we we just don't put that much in there. But if we got a little bit of oil on a like a paper towel, for instance, we'll throw a paper towel in there. You know, uh, it, unless the whole thing's soaked in oil, then we're gonna throw it in the trash. Um, right. So, yeah, it, it's those types of things. Um, that you just have to keep in mind. And like I said, experiment with it and know that if you're potentially throwing off the ratios a whole bunch, uh, that you may end up having a situation that you, you don't like that attracts animals that, uh, you know, doesn't decompose, um, or that really stinks, uh, whatever it might be. It, it's just not going to be great. So, um, experiment just a little bit with stuff that, uh, especially in the beginning that you don't mind the smell of it at that much of it decomposing, I'd say, you know, like grass clippings are a good one. Decomposed grass clippings. It's not a great smell if you've ever smelled decomposed grass clippings, but it's not super offensive, like a rotten chicken or so something horrible. Right. Um, and, and just experiment. The, the other thing I'd say is keep some Browns handy uh, because like us in the beginning, we had so many greens. We just kept throwing greens in there from the kitchen scraps, right? Just became a habit for us. That's our trash can for the kitchen, you know? And so we'd throw stuff in the compost bin. And we didn't have browns around, and we didn't know where to find them. We didn't know about putting our shredded mail in the compost. We thought we have to have leaves and, and stuff out of the yard to throw in there. And in the summertime, you know, there's not very much – dead material around so what we ended up doing is we saved a bunch of deciduous leaves from friends and families uh, yards and we offered to clean them up ourselves and 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 take them with us to our house and keep them in trash bags next to the compost bin so that when summer came around spring and summer 
that we had enough Browns to throw in there. And uh, now whenever I see deciduous leaves blowing around, I'm thinking, oh, man, what a waste. Somebody collect those. Those those are so great. And uh, you can you can dive deep into the, the, the people that love these deciduous leaves because there's something called leaf mold. Have you heard about leaf mold? Yeah. It's uh, – beautiful it's amazing stuff for uh, growing things and um anyway i i'll get off on tangents about uh about <laughs> brown leaves it's one of my favorite things to stockpile like uh, some people are preppers and keep canned goods and i'm keeping brown leaves that have fallen off trees um, well it's funny because i have we have no leaves here we have no. just dead pine needles um and it's I'm glad that you talked about the the ratio and keeping brown on hand and stuff because I'm I'm it's clicking in my head where we've gone wrong with our compost or where I've gone wrong with our composting is a couple things right it, and I I'm assuming these are all newbie things too because I'm sure people watching are thinking the same thing if they've never done it before and that is you know the compost becomes the catch all. Right. So the ratio is off because obviously I have so many brown pine needles here that I could probably compost my entire town <laughs> or everybody's gardens. But the problem is, is all I have is the brown more than the green. Yeah. Um, the other thing is you compared compost to taking care of a house plant, which was a really great analogy because that's another problem, right? It, it You dump everything in and then you just walk away, which is not the case. And the kitchen garbage, like that's exactly what mine has become. Yeah. And, and, and it's okay. I, I think, I think the biggest thing about composting is that, you know, you're creating an ecosystem, but it's also like a chemical kind of reaction thing too. And that you, it's almost like cooking in a way too. You know, you have to have the right ratios or, you know, it's going to be too salty or too, too sugary or uh, whatever, you, you know, it's not going to rise or I don't know what, whatever, whatever all the, the cooking stuff, you know, challenges that have been, but you have to start. If, if you don't ever start cooking, you never will know how to, how to cook. You know, you could follow a recipe but you might not have those ingredients at your store or you may, you know, may not have them on hand or whatever. And, and so just getting familiar with, okay, I'm going to need a little bit of this and a little bit of that and put it together. And, Oh, I forgot this season is the rainy season. Everything's wet and it's too wet now. What do I do? And you'll learn over time. Yeah. Keep these things on hand. Um, don't add them yet. Add them later. Um, so, yeah, uh, give yourself a whole bunch of grace, too, because it's a learning process. I'm still learning stuff. Like I said about the, uh, about the straw uh, way back when <laughs> and herbicides, I never even thought. Um, I just thought, yeah, this, this is going to be good for the garden. And Yeah, and I've, I've heard – actually, I had a subscriber um, educate me on manure, cow manure. Yeah. And I feel – I feel dumb right now because I can't remember the exact scenario, but it was similar to what you said about things that were sprayed, but basically it was the cattle are given a certain antibiotic or something. And then it stays in the soil for so long and it kills your plants. Yeah. Yet everybody thinks let's get some, you know, cow manure yeah. to put in the garden. Yeah. The, the thing about cow manure or steer manure, as they often call it, is that it, it usually comes from feedlots where they just are feeding a ton of grain, and uh, which it is fine, but um, it ends up building up and it has nowhere to kind of disperse all the salts and things. So you got a bunch of salt in it, and, and that, can, that can change things too. But, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff – you're just going to have to experiment with and, and find out. I had somebody tell me before not to put um, pine shavings um, in, in uh, the compost. And I thought that's really interesting. We've used it for bedding for chickens and other animals here many times. Um, it breaks down just fine. And 
And he said, yeah, pine needles and pine shavings don't break down for me at all. They have some, um, I don't know what it was, an enzyme or a, a hormone or something that doesn't allow things to break down so that beneath the pine trees, that's why they kill off all the other plants. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Well, it must be breaking down in my compost because I've never had a problem with it. So I think there's there's a difference there too. Maybe maybe that person's compost was too wet or too dry or they didn't wait long enough. Um, yeah. Or, or, or whatever. Uh, um, a lot of people have a concern about the type of bin. It has to be a certain size bin or a certain shape or have certain functions to the bin. Like I said, you could do it right on the ground in a pile and, and that could work just fine for you. Um, what, what type of compost, uh, pile do you have, Lisa? Do you have it in a container or? We have two in containers. One is one of those, you know, hexagonal ones that towns had given out at one point. Oh yeah. Uh, and someone gave it to us. We also have one that is a tumbler. Yep. And then quite honestly, we have a very large pile in the back of the property, which yep. doesn't get a lot of attention, but that's all the chicken coop stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that those are a great variety of, of compost bins and piles to have. Uh, we have, we have two um, pallet wood mm -hmm. bays that I've made that are, are basically um, like a, three or four sided, um, bay, I guess is, is, or, a uh, uh, I don't know, a rectangular spot mm -hmm. to put the compost. And, uh, I, I made those out of pallet wood. The pallets were free. It took me a little bit of time. I have a video, uh, yep. up on our channel about how, how I built that, but, um, that's a really easy way. It just keeps the compost there when the wind blows and, and other things uh, keeps it there, keeps animals out a little bit maybe, but um, really it's just there for us to stack it up. And then at some point we take it and we turn it over and put it in the other one to finish it up. And every once in a while we'll turn it with the pitchfork. But um, a lot of times you don't really need to do that. Uh, for us, it dries out on the exterior. So it's almost like the exterior is a mulch for what's inside and inside stays pretty moist and it's always going and it's hot and that's where meat and stuff can break down. But on the outside, it, it just looks like nothing's going on because nothing really is. It's, it's just mulch on the outside, keeping the moisture in. Uh, right. We should probably be using a tarp over it to keep it all uh, moist, but, um, but that's what we use. We also have two tumbling composters like you do. Those work okay. Um, but I found that I just, I really like those, those bays that I have, they're just one right next to another. And ideally I would probably have five or six of those and I'd mm -hmm. probably have a tractor. <laughs> I would, you know, turn them over. They'd be just wide enough for my tractor and I'd move them, you know, from bin to bin until they're finished. Um, but uh, it, it could be a tumbling composter, which is nice because that keeps that air going and it really uh, mixes everything well together. Um, but if you live in the Southwest, like I do, remember to water it like a, like a potted plant because it'll dry out and there'll just be a bunch of dry stuff rolling around in there. Um, okay. It, it's nice because in, in wet places it it's covered, right? It's all contained. Right. So it can't get too wet usually, which, which is really good. Um, there's also the, like your hexagonal thing, I think is, is like a five sided plastic thing or six sided or whatever they are. Um, those work good. Also a hole in the ground. My uncle, when I was little, he had a hole in the ground and he threw all his stuff in there. And I thought, this guy is nuts. What's he doing? Burying, you know, is this dead bodies he's putting in there? <laughs> banana peels. Why is he putting banana peels in the ground? That's so strange. But it works. It, it keeps, you know, it keeps it um, there. And then he could put a top on it or he could put dirt on top. And then it would compost in there and he could dig it up and put it um, in his in his garden. Um, but yeah, the, the classic above ground pile works well too. Uh, there's a, I forget what it's called, the Sioux bioreactor, I think. Have you ever heard of a, a bioreactor, Lisa? Uh, so no. this, this is a fancy, fancy composting setup, but you can look it up if you just type in bioreactor, um, 
it's it's a way where they they actually put a tube that's like a perforated um, pipe down the middle to yeah. increase airflow, and then on the outsides, it's usually like a cattle panel um, that they keep around it, and that that's basically to get a ton of air. Uh, they figured out that if the air can get into the pile, it, it's it, it takes it has to be about a foot away from any air source, I guess, is what their theory is. And then you don't need to turn it at all. You can just dump stuff in until it's full, and then you just leave it be. And as long as you have enough moisture, it works good. Here in Arizona, I'll tell you what, I've experimented with it quite a bit. I think I have a video up on a Rubbermaid trash can. I drilled a bunch of holes in it and put a pipe in the middle and tried it out. And the bottom got soupy, and the <laughs> top was dry. Mm -hmm. So anyway, in an ideal world, it'd be nice to just put stuff in and it just composts itself and you're done. But what we've experienced is that either you have that kind of crusty mulch on the outside if you just leave it alone and don't turn it and then the inside's great. And then you take that crust from the outside and start a new pile and hopefully sometime it will be done. Um, or you turn it all the time and you water it all the time and you keep the tarp over it and, and you're really good about managing it and you're always in there you know putting air in it and water and making sure the ratios are correct and that's great you can turn it over in, in probably two weeks time even a huge pile if if you keep on it and you've got all the ratios right everything's ideal yeah. i'd say two weeks you could probably turn stuff over so wow. it doesn't take long if you've got a spot uh, you should go for it. Um, Billy from Perma Pastures Farm. I don't know if you know Billy from Perma Pastures mm -hmm. Farm, but I believe he's in either Virginia or North Carolina. And uh, anyway, he he does the. I think it. I think he even calls it ten day composting, something like that. But wow. they're they're constantly out there. I think it's like two times a day. They're flipping it and watering it a whole bunch, and then putting a tarp over top. And you can get finish compost real fast but i would say it could be as fast as two weeks it could be as long as two years um so depending on on how fast you really need that compost um it can be a pretty quick uh process but uh I, one of the tips i wrote down here was that um it's like a sourdough starter uh I'm thinking that <laughs> if, if if you get some from your previous batch, uh, even that crusty stuff on the outside that I was talking about here in the Southwest, and, and you, you put some of that in, in the next pile, it'll go a lot faster because the decomposers are already there. They don't have to find it. So um, that's a good thing. You can, also, um, you can also start on fertile ground. So if you've got a fertile garden bed and you don't have any compost, save a little corner of that garden bed and start a compost pile there. You'll be amazed at all the worms and decomposers that come up through the surface of your garden or, in, or any fertile spot um, underneath. We have juniper trees here and underneath the juniper trees, it's real fertile. It's, it's been naturally composting all of the, um, you know, juniper limbs and leaves and stuff like that for, or needles for, for decades. So it's pretty fertile there. So, Starting a compost pile where you already know there's a fertile spot is a really a really good uh, way to, to get going because mm -hmm. those decomposers will come up and, and start uh, for you right away. Um, worms are good. Uh, we've purchased red worms in the past, to, and mm -hmm. there's a whole side of composting called verma, vermicompost or verm, vermiculture. So... You take red worms and they've got all these kind of layered systems where the worms can move up through the new food that's you know you're putting in the top and they've got a spigot for worm tea that comes out and you can use that as a fer liquid fertilizer all around mm -hmm. your garden and um, all kinds of stuff that's that's cool that's fun don't ever put in too much watermelon rind uh, just ask me how I know uh, we had <laughs> something like that it was disgusting. Killed all the worms. Oh, no. It was horrible. It was just too much moisture all at once. And they went to town and it turned into just worm and watermelon soup. It was really oh. gross. 
So um, keep, keep that in mind. You got to keep the ratios right for the worms too. If you if you yeah. decide to use worms, you can also buy red worms. They sell them for fishing. You can just dump those in the compost, uh, and they'll help out. Um, there's also mycelium uh, fungi. Have you heard of mycelium fungi, Lisa? Mm. So nope. it's like a, a white fungus, um, and it breaks down uh, woody material primarily. Uh, so if you ever have a big pile of wood chips and it stays moist, usually around the bottom of it here in Arizona, you'll see all this kind of white, white looking stuff on the wood chips. And that's the mycelium breaking down, um, breaking down the wood. But, uh -huh. um, mycelium likes to be left alone. So, um, uh -huh. There's a, a no-till method of gardening, and that really promotes the mycelium. Uh, and it's it's kind of a symbiotic relationship that it gets with plant roots, and it's a huge topic in itself. But uh, if you see kind of white stuff growing in there, it it's not necessarily mold, but it is a fungus, and it's really beneficial. It's it it's the gold. It's pure gold for composting. So if you see that. Um, it's awesome, but it does like to be left alone when we flip our pile and we see it on the, the carbon kind of brown materials. Um, we're, we're super excited because we know, um, it, yep. it's really working in there. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a good thing. And that's why we've chosen to do, do, um, primarily no-till, uh, gardening as well, because it, it doesn't disturb that mycelium and all the other, um, soil organisms. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much, uh, most of my notes here, Lisa, I, um, ha the last, the, the last note is, um, try, you know, after you get this down a little bit, try composting everything, see how that works out. Um, because for us, when we've tried composting everything, we've been really surprised, like with those, those quail parts, uh, when we butchered the quail. I can't tell you how amazed I was. I thought it'd be really gross and there'd be this real weird decomposition stench coming up. There was nothing and I could not believe it. I thought maybe an animal did get this stuff out of here, but no, no, I saw those little leg bands in there and I thought, wow, wow. that happened so fast. A week and a half and they're just gone. So, um, so try it, experiment and uh, have fun with it. You're going to end up with um, stuff that's better than anything you could buy for your garden. That's awesome. And Nick, I, got, I can't even begin to tell you how much I learned today from you. I do have two questions for you. And one of which was funny because I was going to compare it to the sourdough starter because I just learned how to do sourdough. Yeah. I mean, obviously I'm a newbie, but I'm figuring it out. So sourdough starter is ratios. Yeah. But it's a cl pretty clear ratio. Right. So for somebody new out there and you want to set them up for success, would you suggest, you know, um, an approximate ratio for those items to help them? Or is that something that cannot be estimated? I mean, it's it's really hard. Uh, I've seen a lot of ratios. You can look online for for brown and green ratios and see what people say. But honestly, Lisa, for us in the Southwest, it's a, it's a different bag altogether uh, because true. everything dries out so fast. It goes from green to brown almost immediately if you don't have enough water in there. So, but what I would say is, uh, and I've done this before, and, and this, is, this is truly amazing, is, and you kind of have to trust people. So depends on your level of trust of strangers, but uh, maybe, maybe, you know, somebody that you trust. Um, I put an ad on Craigslist and said, I will take your grass clippings and I will take your dried leaves for free. You just leave them out front. Don't throw them away. I will compost them and I'll come and get them. And you know, it's just within our town. Right. But mm -hmm. somebody took me up on that and he said, I don't use any, you know, herbicides, any pesticides. I use a little bit of inorganic fertilizer. I said, Hey, that's fine. I, I'm okay with that. But he had two big trash bags full of uh, lawn clippings throughout the summer. And he said he would send me a, an email every time he had them ready. 
and say, hey, they're out front. And, you know, if you don't pick them up right away, they're going to get smelly. And I said, I don't care. I'm composting them. It doesn't matter. But I would go and pick them up just to be kind and make sure that he keeps putting them out there for me. But there's all kinds of places that have deciduous trees, you know, a lot of places that um, – even parks and, and sometimes your, your city will have, have some kind of program like that. Some, you know what, we've been burned on our city's compost before when we lived in San Diego. That's, I'm pretty sure we had some herbicides in there, unfortunately, but it, it killed off a big part of our garden. So be careful about that. But uh, most people don't spray their trees with any kind of weird stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, the deciduous leaves, you know, this time of year too, uh, a lot of people might just have them in a big pile and you say, hey, can I put those in the back of my pickup and take them home? Uh, they might look at you a little funny, but it's seriously, I, I keep those those brown leaves available, especially for summertime. And uh, so I would say, you know, probably two by volume. If, it's hard to say by weight, but I'd say by volume, if you had trash bags full, I'd say probably two or three trash bag fulls of uh, brown leaves to every one trash bag full of, of grass clippings. It's kind of the ratio I would go with. And, um, you know, if it dries out too fast or it's looking like all the, all the grass clippings are just becoming dried grass in there, then um, I'd increase the grass clippings, maybe increase the water a little bit. That's the problem that we have here. Uh, but, um, if it's becoming soup, just keep some more of those brown um, leaves on hand and just add them in and dry it out. Okay. And that's kind of the idea is that if it gets soupy, dry it out with some more browns. Um, even even the shredded mail, uh, you know, we have that on hand at all times. We've got trash bags full of shreds that we can just throw in if it gets to be um, too wet and soupy. That's awesome. You actually answered two of my questions in there. So that's oh. perfect. <laughs> Good. What was well, the other question? Well, I think I had the, you answered both, like getting extra stuff from other, you know, oh, resources. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm going to say this, my last question. And the reason why I say this is because I try to think of what other people might ask. Yeah. So, you know, I'm living here in South Dakota. Uh, water is kind of challenging in the wintertime. Yeah. What would you suggest for somebody who's in a winter climate? That's a very good very good question. So it was 23 degrees here this morning. It was pretty cold. Everything was frosted over. Ground was hard. Uh, not not super deep. And now it's in the mid 50s. So it's not bad. But that's a real challenge. Uh, it's uh, things will freeze and uh, things will slow down considerably, even to a standstill in your compost pile if it's small. If it's large count your blessings because it will probably continue and you just need to turn it, keep turning the outside to the inside and just, it's almost like keeping a fire going. If, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, you got to keep the inside lit, right? You got to keep it, keep it hot enough, but you also want to keep giving it more so that it doesn't kind of burn out in the middle because it will get cold, especially in the winter. It could get cold. There's compost thermometers. Those are really handy uh, just to see kind of where you are in that compost pile, especially in the winter. I need to go and find mine now that we moved. I'm not sure where it went, but it's a great tool to have. Um, and Celsius or Fahrenheit, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, we got one of those Celsius on accident. We didn't even realize it, but uh, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. It's just going to give you kind of a window of, okay, I'm in that window. Cool. That's that's where I was hoping to be. Or oh no, it's not that great. I need to add more greens, and that will greens will will increase the temperature for you. Um, but yeah, water you're gonna want to uh, keep it like a potted plant. You know, uh, so, somewhat uh, wet, but not not soaking wet. Makes perfect sense. I totally get it. Oh, oh, I apologize for the barking dog. That's all right. Is that diesel? That is diesel. The one and only. I love it. I know it. I know it. I apologize for that. Well, Nick, I just want to thank you again very much. Thank you very much. Um, 
This well, is what happens when somebody drops off something while I'm recording. Yep. Yep. I know the feeling. I know it. Well, Nick. Diesel's <laughs> got my dogs barking now. So, yeah, it must be time to go. I apologize. And I'm sorry, folks. I can't edit this out. So, we're going to end. <laughs> But I just thank you very much, Nick. And Nick will be in the chat, as everybody knows. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. And Nick, this has been so beneficial. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure, Lisa. <laughs> All right. Take care. All right. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.